Okay, I'm going to reprise the story we broke yesterday that still no main, mainstream media seem to want to touch, and that is the curious family connections um, that all go back to our Minister of Foreign Affairs and Local Government, Nanaya Mahuta. Uh, the fact that her hu husband, William Ormsby, and his company, KASL, um, seem to have been intimately involved in the production of the Hapua Pua report and are basically consultants to the government across a whole range of issues around co-governance and, in particular, Three Waters. It is opaque, unclear, uncertain just how the husband of a Cabinet Minister got these appointments. Um, we have had next to nothing from Nanaya Mahuta's office. She says she wasn't involved, nothing to see here. Um, also, of course, Tipi Mahuta, who is the sister of the Minister, holds uh, more... Um, appointments than I can uh, remember off the top of my head and she is by all accounts a very good uh, bureaucrat but is there something going on here is there something that we need to look at when we look at what is apparently nepotism uh, surrounding our Minister of Foreign Affairs and Minister of Local Government well I can tell you uh, we approached both the ACT and National Parties last night um, or yesterday to talk about this and they are aware of the story and my understanding is both parties are attempting to verify the information that we've already verified um, and will, uh, I certainly understand the National Party are going to be asking questions in Parliament. But with the mainstream media who seem more interested in doing a travel diary for the Prime Minister, uh, it I, I believe these issues are important and many, literally thousands of you believe these issues are important and need to be discussed in a functional democracy. And I thought someone to give an interesting perspective on this, someone who has experience in the law, vast experience in politics, has been, I think, the Minister of Māori Affairs, has certainly been our Minister of Foreign Affairs and uh, has been indeed the Deputy Prime Minister of New Zealand. Currently not in Parliament, but I think he wants to change that come the next election. His name is, uh, he's the Right Honourable Winston Raymond Peters, and he joins us uh, on the line now. Uh, Mr Peters, a very good morning to you, and thank you for joining us on the platform. Uh, good morning. Uh, look, I just want to deal with one other story that's kicking around, I don't think as important as this one. Nanaya Mahuta, it was revealed yesterday, hasn't had a phone conversation or hasn't spoken directly to our ambassador in Russia since the Ukrainian invasion. That seems a little odd. You might be on the blower to our kind of tip of the spear diplomat in a situation like this. Well, I had, it's hard to believe, but neither has she made contact with uh, the Solomon Islands as well. And really, in the, in the Moscow situation, which is the new or rebuilt embassy of ours, in that situation, the embassy staff and the ambassador would be feeling under tremendous pressure, and you'd have thought a sympathetic call would have been made at the time of the outbreak of the invasion of Ukraine, and likewise the Solomon Islands as well. It's really unbelievable that that has been just left to the department. They, they are members of the of MFAT, but the fact is you are the minister, and you expect in circumstances like that to reach out and talk to people and give them a sympathetic ear. Maybe they're not on the family phone tree, Mr Peters, because it seems an awful lot of other people in areas uh, in receiving money from the government are uh, related to Nā Naya Mahuta. We have shared with you, I think, some of the research that we've based our stories on. What do you make? First of all, let's just look at the big picture. Um, we've had nothing back from Nā Naya Mahuta. She won't comment, nor will the government comment. Is there nothing to see here? Did we get it wrong? The government is not commenting and the Prime Minister is not commenting because they've been allowed by the mainstream media to get away with this woke, uh, you might call it a cultural re-engineering program without being held to account. It is simply disgusting. The fact is that Hey Purple report was commissioned in secret with no consultation with the coalition partner. When they received it, they kept it in secret, didn't give it to the coalition. Well, partner. it was written by, 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 by relatives, wasn't it, of Nanaya Mahuta, with no 
constitutional law experience or experience in history, and it would seem to me a lot of the people who were involved in the authorship, well, <laughs> did not seem qualified to me to be involved uh, in writing a document of that import. Well, uh, sadly, you're one of the first people in the media to say that because the rest have been bought off by the uh, public interest fund with the comes to journalism. And again, you know, you talk about the fourth estate having its uh, responsibilities and we're getting on to talk about what Naima, Naima Uta has been doing and should not have been doing. But what you're seeing writ large here is unbridled nepotism and going unchallenged and from people who are not qualified to do the job in the first place. That's the disgraceful part about it. It's not racist to say, who said you are remotely qualified to do this job? And we can look at that in relation to appointments to the Waste Management or the Maori Subcommittee of the Waste Management Plan, which once again, Mr Ormsby and his family company seems to be involved, involved with highly. Uh, do you think there is a difference between the activities of Mr Ormsby and Tipa Mahuta, who is uh, the Minister's sister? Yes, but here we come again. Uh, when you look at the process, and the minister has said, look, I stepped aside, I gave it to Kelvin Barris for the brief time he, he had the option, option to make the choice, and then I moved back in my roles. This sort of wink, wink, nod, nod uh, behaviour is just uh, unacceptable. Uh, look, if people have got cap capability. I can remember, remember the three Prebbles, Richard Preble, well, the two of his brothers were brighter than Richard by a long shot. You remember them? One was from Treasury, and the other guy was a lawyer. Now, no one accused Richard of nepotism, even though one was in Treasury. But in this case, uh, you've got people asking, how on earth could someone in this circumstance be in the position that they're in? Do you, how do we deal with this then? A and the research we've got, I'm just going to quote a couple of lines. As regards to William Ormsby's company, that is the minister's husband's company, which seems to be um, promising access and coordination with government on a whole lot of issues. Um, the person who's done this research says, I would expect there to be at least some clear guidelines as to what type of lobbying KASL can undertake in what sectors and who it can and can't approach in government. That is usually the case for lobby firms set up by ministers after they leave government, at least in the UK. Also points out that William Normsby has a criminal conviction for assault on a, on a female and he appears to have no formal qualifications for lobbying or consultancy. Um, I, I can't believe, uh, Mr Peters, that there wasn't someone better qualified in Māoridom um, to do the job that KASL is doing. Well, if we want to look at it impartially and fair, the question you'd be asking is, well, let's see who else was given a fair shot at that job and what were their qualifications. And we're not getting any answers, we're not getting any, any advice at all. No one's responding. And I have to tell you that this is the problem of the Prime Minister. She's going to have to hold her ministers to account. In the end, the buck stops with her. Uh, mm. The paradox of this, you're talking about a company called Carver's Hair Services. I don't know if you know the Maori policy that was launched in 1990. Mm. Uh, one by me, but it's called Carver's Hair. <laughs> I was looking at it, I thought this is a horrible paradox coming. But the point I want to say, and this was a a Māori policy of independence and uh, where the, the, the salvation of Māori, Māori would come from within itself and not from the taxpayer. But here we come uh, to, to 2022 and the question's being asked, uh, what is, um, how shall I say, echoing uh, through the uh, halls of, at the moment is a void of answers mm -hmm. and no explanation as to so many telling questions which you and I know, mm. if other people had engaged them, they would be hauled over the coals and be in front of the uh, uh, the newspapers in the page mm. one and the front of the news in the day. Yeah, the reason, look, not on yeah the, and I'd give an example of, of what you're saying, and this is just a quote from the research we've got. Given the significance of her purpura, it appears to be highly irregular for two family members of the minister to appear as co-authors and contributors when they do not seem to have any level of qualification or expertise in constitutional law that would place them at the elite level that authorship of such a document would demand. Who appointed the authors to her pua pua? Who determined who was able to contribute? What was the criteria involved? And was any thought given to the fact that these were close relations of the minister who commissioned the report? Why were these relationships with Nanaya Mahuta not disclosed in the report? 
Has their involvement in the report even been publicly acknowledged from the government? So it seems to me it, it, it goes on and on. How do you fix a problem like this? How do you put Caesar's wife above suspicion or prove the case against her? Well, there's no way that this is going to be a case of above suspicion now. But the person who should be answering, sad to say, and it's not an attack on her, but the Prime Minister is the person who should be answering this question. But if you are actively engaged in the covert secrecy of a policy which you held from the very people that you were in coalition with, as the Prime Minister did, then she can't deny it. Because if she's saying that I didn't know, as she said at the time, my question to her is, well, why haven't you, sold, why haven't you sacked Nanaya Mahuta? If she didn't tell you, that was a sacking offence. So the Prime Minister is in this conspiracy, in this context. And here's the real point. They're into social engineering by stealth. And it stinks. It's got an accurate stench about it now. Um, I do note that other political parties haven't joined the fray on this yet and mainstream media have not covered the story at all. Why do you think that is? Well, when you go from being the fourth estate, fearless about pulling the truth no matter who's involved, to a bunch of fifth columnists for a political organisation on the left, that's the outcome you get. Mm. And I'm afraid, I'm so sorry to see that, and there are a few outliers who are holding staunch to their role as the fourth estate, mm. but there's far too many who are utterly compromised and they are disgraced to their profession. Mm. I talk, reached out to a number of people I know in Māori them and in government yesterday for background on this, and three of them used the same words to tell me, don't you understand, Sean, the Mahutas are royalty. They can do what they want. Well, when you say that they're royalty, um, uh, then what you're really saying is that every ethic about equality that this country stands for has just gone out the window. So you're, you're saying that some people are above the law. Some well, well the impression I got from talking to people was that I didn't understand how Maori politics works, and you've got to understand the Mahutas are so powerful, they have so much mana, the normal rules do not apply for, for them, and I, and I had a long conversation with one bureaucrat, he said, look, it's not going to be co-governance between, if there is co-governance, let's entertain that idea, between, say, uh, the Crown and, and Maori entities, it's not going to be co-governance between two democratic institutions with the same standards, it's going to be a power elite in Māoridom that you'll co-govern with, not a functional, democratic, accountable um, body. Well, that might be the view of the people that if you talk to us, and I can understand their frustration, but that is not in any way excusable or acceptable. No, no, I don't think it is. What can you do as, well, a politician out of Parliament... Um, a candidate, essentially, um, in the reality. Is there anything that Winston Peters can do about this? And is there anything that people listening can do about this issue? Well, what I can do, uh, because I've done it before, uh, the whole time of my political career, I've always been for one law for everybody, one law for all. I've always been for one flag, one set of, uh, of, uh, of how shall I say, it, the national values that we all share as a country and respectful people uh, but this uh, this business that have been has been forced upon the country has the potential to just take this country to third world status very very quickly mm. and so what we're going to do is confront them everywhere we can and ensure the very people who are the greatest victims of this uh, policy that Nanaya Mahuta and her colleagues are engaged in that is the Maori people, because they'll suffer the most when all this is over. I need to understand who's sold them down the drain. It's very, very simple what's got to happen here. I want to come back though, Stress. Ma, the Minister's office has told us she has no say in the appointments of these family members. Do you think that is the case? Do you think she is telling the truth? It is not the case, and that is not the truth. So you're calling... Um, the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Local Government a liar. There is a big difference between the, what you've come to and the way of your conclusion. I'm saying that if, if the Minister was to say that that's the truth, then that would be an admission of utter incompetence. It cannot be the truth. So what do we need? Who, who inquires into this? Do we have a Royal Commission? Do we call in the Audit Office? Does um, State Services Commission look into all these matters? Is that the appropriate body 
to probe this? Well, well, Sean, a damn good start would be question time in Parliament. And yeah. Why are we sitting here after all this time since that report has been kept secret and so little being done about it? Yeah. Have question time to hold them to account. Don't leave off. Yeah. Well, my understanding is that uh, Christopher Luxon is a bit busy learning to Rayo at the moment. That was his headline yesterday in the media. Well, this is fine, but how about learning how the democracy works and why uh, we are one of only nine countries since 1854 to have had uh, unbroken elections, and I'm one of only nine. Mm. It's, not, it's not very far to go from a country like ours to what called Myanmar or um, the, um, Venezuela, because governments do matter and what politicians do matters as well. We're in a very dangerous circumstance at the moment. Mm. Uh, Winslow, thank you for joining us. There's one thing before you go. The Prime Minister, of course, in New York today, heading down to the White House, where she may or may not meet the President of the United States, Joe Biden. I seem to remember there was a story about you either having or not having shaken hands with Ronald Reagan. Oh, that's a backbencher. That's right. <laughs> Did, come on, put it to rest. Did you actually meet Ronald Reagan or not? No, I didn't meet Ronald Reagan, and I never said I did. <laughs> uh, but, uh, where's the point? If the Prime Minister is not meeting her counterpart, the real question that New Zealand is going to have to ask themselves is, given how critical the situation is now around parts of the world, including the Pacific, why did she take this trip now? Why didn't she wait until she could see him? Or why didn't she, like Albanese, get to Japan? No, maybe she was more interested in seeing her old mate Stephen Colbert and getting a slot on The Late Show. I'm not aware of that part of it. I'm, but my concern was that not to, to not be seeing the, 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 the counterpart, the President of the United States, we need to get some things sorted out real fast. Mm. What things do we need to get sorted out? Well, the, the Solomon Islands, as Kurt Campbell has admitted, is, is a, a situation where they admit that they're near neglect of the Pacific and had to act. All those things should have happened with the, the Saga Barry a long time ago, but no one's been to see him since, 19, uh, since 2019. And then you've got hundreds of millions of people facing starvation because of uh, the storage of wheat and other grains in Ukraine at this point in time. These are calamitous events which we have to uh, pay attention to. Now, you will know that the woke left will be screaming blue murder about this, but my question then is, so what did your leadership do about it? Yep, I hear you. Uh, uh, Winston, always good talking. I thank you very much for taking the time this morning and sticking your head up over a parapet that many other politicians seem keen to hide behind. Um, thank you very much indeed for your contribution this morning. <laughs> that, is, that is the leader of New Zealand First, Winston Peters. Um, not contesting Tauranga, his old stamping ground, but my understanding is New Zealand First certainly eyeing Javier's serious crack and Winston will be back at our next election. And he says, well, this is Ben. Uh, he wouldn't go as far as to call Nanaya Mahuta, who tells us that nothing to see here is a liar um, but we will keep pursuing this story and we are hopeful we are hopeful that the opposition parties in parliament do their job do their job and question these serious issues about possible or perceived corruption or nepotism around the Minister of Foreign Affairs and Local Government Na Naya Mahuta